Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again here. It's uh, shortly we are, with many of you, are meeting again after Monday's uh, lecture here by Marko Chertov, and I would say that we are further somehow harvesting on uh, the global Globsec uh, conference in Bratislava because. Uh, the gentlemen like George Friedman or Michael Chertoff are not coming to uh, Europe every month. Uh, so we are very glad, and I have to thank also Tomáš uh, Krsek, uh, who is the well-known entrepreneur, but also a publisher, uh, who uh, co-organized this uh, evening uh, with us as the publisher of just uh, recently released uh, uh, last book and its translation, uh, last book by George Friedman and its translation into the Czech uh, language. <coughs> At the end of the evening, uh, you uh, can buy the book uh, in the Czech uh, language uh, for a cheaper price uh, because it's here directly with the publisher. Uh, the book uh, which uh, was published in uh, the U.S. and in the world under the title Flashpoints, uh, the emergence, Emerging Crisis in Europe, and the Czech uh, subtitle is, Czech title is uh, Ohrožená Evropa. I uh, saw a lot of people from the security uh, community today here, and it's not surprising because uh, George uh, Friedman is, uh, I would say, even a hero or a master for the intelligence community all over the world. Uh, after he um, successfully, as a uh, kid of uh, the Jewish uh, uh, Holocaust survival, he escaped as a little child uh, from communist uh, Hungary uh, right after the war and uh, finish his studies at the Corbin University, uh, slowly became a real uh, recognized and leading uh, expert on the briefing to the intelligence and security community in the U.S. and elsewhere on the issues like uh, security, threats, geopolitics, and also the forecasting, so not just uh, knowing the past, but also uh, the ability to uh, transfer the knowledges and the analysis into uh, the an analysis what we can expect in, in uh, future. Uh, he founded uh, probably the most uh, known uh, private intelligence organization. Somebody calls this, some people call this the private CIA, uh, called Stratford, which is one of the leading source of uh, uh, the open sources of uh, uh, communication, even for professionals. Uh, being uh, involved as uh, the CEO of uh, the organization for 20 years, just this year he left Stratford and has established with the wife uh, Meredith, which has helped, who has helped us also to prepare this uh, event, and thank you very much for your cooperation. A new uh, private organization, which is called uh, the Geopolitical Futures. Uh, George Friedman is also very well known as the author of uh, many, uh, many books. Uh, uh, in fact, the Flashpoint is not the first book which has been translated into the Czech language uh, the uh, next hundred years. Přištík uh, Stolet was published a couple of years ago, I think, in Argo. And he also became famous with his book, uh, uh, The Future of War, in the 90s. I have used the term of ge geopolitics, and this is uh, something special, because usually the Americans are not very strong in the geopolitics. It's a naval power, 
uh, geopolitics is rather the domain of uh, the continental powers, so Russians, Germans, to a certain extent, of course, the UK, because it had to balance the continental power throughout the history in uh, Europe, so they have learned their lessons. But uh, the United States were, in fact, not so much exposed to uh, the lessons of the geopolitics, but now the geopolitics is uh, fully back in, in, in Europe, and therefore it's uh, great uh, that there is a leading uh, voice also in the West. Uh, he calls Europe in his new books a peninsula. It's just a peninsula of the largest continent. So it sounds for, you know, uh, the, the confident uh, uh, Europhiles as something, you know, strange. Uh, but in fact, uh, it makes a sense to uh, know something about the geography. And the knowledge of the history uh, certainly helps to understand not just the present, but uh, also the ability to forecast the future. And this book is, I would say, particularly important in identifying uh, what, he, in fact, uh, George Friedan calls the flashpoint. So a certain area like the fault lines, which despite all uh, attempts, you know, to unify the continent are still, uh, still exist and uh, could still be uh, the source of uh, the future uh, uh, conflicts. So, uh, in his book, I have read and made especially special remarks on this that the, current, the, 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 the largest problem of Europe is uh, that it's rich but weak, and that the combination of the wealth and the weakness is one of the most dangerous combination for any kind of a, um, a social uh, group like states or nation or whatever. So, uh, I would finish my introductory remarks with uh, just a recommendation. You know, this is uh, one of those books which makes a sense not just to uh, read, but also uh, to take it seriously because since 2008, and that's maybe another, and here we are, we are common. Uh, common platform. 2008 is a kind of a turning point. You know, we still have a fresh memories of the 90, 90s, turn of the millennium as something what was really the heydays, the paradise for this continent. But uh, since 2008, it turned somehow into a problem, challenges, potential conflicts, and this book is exactly about this. So once again, George, thank you very much for coming uh, uh, to Prague. Thank you very much for um, your willingness to share some uh, your time with you with us, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you for coming and taking the time to hear what little I have to say while I look at this magnificent indoor court and feel very much at home. I'm speaking now to a Czech audience, or Chechen audience, whatever it is this week. <laughs> I still haven't gotten used to not using Czechoslovakia, so forgive me. I'm speaking to an audience that understands what I'm going to be talking about intimately because as with me you learned it at your kitchen table not in your schools. It is the story of Europe and it's a story of Europe in the 20th century and it's a terrible story and a magnificent story a story of monsters and heroes 
that Homer could have written about. But I wrote the book in a way that Americans could understand it. And Americans necessarily understand things differently because I live at the bridge between the United States and America. I'm Hungarian. I'm American. And I always wonder which knows less about the other, the Europeans or the Americans. Right now, it seems to me the Americans know more. And the Europeans really don't understand the United States. So that when I talk to you, today, and by the way, next week it'll turn around the other way. When I talk to you, it is as an American, because I wrote an American book. But I decided to begin the book with something called a European life. And it was the life of my family that began in Bratislava, when it was still Pozhoin, and in Uzhgorod, in the Ukraine, and went to Budapest, and then to Voronezh, to Mauthausen, to the Danube, and hiding in Bratislava. And it's a tale that's a European tale. And this is the point. There is nothing extraordinary in my family's life. And I know that each of you have stories about your grandparents, perhaps, a little older, who knows of similar horrors, similar heroism, similar capabilities. So I speak to an audience now, I don't have to describe what happened, you know. But there is one part that I have to begin with without telling that story, which is to remind you that it happened. And this is the thing that the Europeans sometimes forget. It happened and it happened here. And there's one fundamental question overriding all of our lives. Could it happen again? There is a confidence and a certainty in Europe that, of course, this is not possible, that this was an aberration that it just took place. When I raise the question with Americans, could it happen again? They say, sure, happened once, could happen again. For us, as Europeans, it's a metaphysical matter because it raises the question, who are we? What is it within our souls that allowed that to happen? Why do we believe that we've exercised the demons? How is it possible that we could be so sure? So for an American audience, I would tell the story of my father and they would be astounded. Nothing there astounds you. For this audience, I ask the question, and this is the reason I really wrote the book. We know this happened. Is this really Europe or is that really Europe? What really is Europe? What is really the European soul? And that, in this world, is perhaps the most frightening question. We have to remember this. In 31 years, between 1914 and 1945, 100 million Europeans died for political causes. I don't mean just wars. I mean Stalin's purges, the civil war in Russia, the starvation in Ukraine, the Spanish Civil War, all of this extraordinary numbers. And I couldn't believe it when I sat down and I said, okay, I'm going to find out. And I came up with that number. But that is the number. So this is a continent. What kind of continent? It is a continent that gave birth to some of the most extraordinary and beautiful things imaginable. I always use an example going to a, a symphony. Is there anything more European, complex, and beautiful than a symphony? And you go there in 1910 on a train from 30 miles away, and you enter a building that has no night. The lights, the night has been abolished. And the cold has been banished. 
and the women are in gowns and the men are in tails and there is a magnificence there in each little piece of it. What Europe did was conquer nature. Not completely, not fully. It took a few American engineers to help you out. But you set the stage with the European Enlightenment for the idea that man's relationship to nature is the foundation of all moral considerations. And that the world can be transformed because of that. And the symphony is something that follows from that because it is the ultimate technical implementation of music, the impl technical implementation of beauty, because it is in the complexity of the instruments, the discipline of the artists, that this cohesion emerges. And this is Europe. Then it all comes apart. The continent that gives us Mozart, that gives us the Viennese Symphony, that gives us the chance to conquer nature, goes berserk. Or if it doesn't go berserk, it follows a reason that is not self-evident. And the difference between being berserk and being irrational, we say different things. And we must try to understand what happened. What happened was very simply that no one trusted each other. And they were completely rational in not trusting each other. Because the idea that a united Germany should simply be trusted was irrational. Once Germany was united in 1871, Europe was changed. Why? Because at the center of Europe now stood a nation so creative, so productive, and so disciplined that it was a symphony. It was so put together, so constructed, that it could, within 20, 30 years, overwhelm France in production and almost equal Britain. Britain with an empire was almost matched by Germany, surrounded by poverty. Germany was an extraordinary country. But it was also a terrified country because it knew that it had not been unified because the French and the Russians and everyone around them had torn them apart in the Holy Roman Empire neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, a trash heap of Germany that the Germans had overcome. And they knew something very mundane. If the French and the Russians attacked them simultaneously, they could not survive. And they had no reason to believe that the French and the Russians would not attack them simultaneously because they understood the French and the Russians were terrified of them, as they should be. Europe generated fear, and the fear was reasonable. We use the term irrational fear. Most usually in this world, your fears are rational, and it's probably worse than you think it's going to be. Certainly that was the case of Europe. Germany had an option. The only way it felt it could survive would be by not allowing the French and the Russians to start the war, to which the answer was, well, of course they don't want to, they haven't thought of it. And the German answer was, no, I should wait till they think of it. And so they came up with a plan. We cannot defeat both. 
Because first we will defeat one, and then we will defeat the other. And this was called the Schlieffen Plan, after the general who conducted this orchestra. And at some point, it took place. Now, there's the theory that this was a complete miscalculation and that they misunderstood each other, and I'm sure we all misunderstand each other. But this was not because the Germans didn't understand. It was because they did understand. And so their plan was to sweep down toward Paris, through Belgium, defeat the French, send their forces to the east, attack the Tsar, defeat the Russians, and be secure. Fear engendered fear, and so the war began. And this is where the brilliance of Europe's enlightenment turned into madness. Because not only did they invent the symphony, but they invented the machine gun and the howitzer. And so a war that was supposed to last a few weeks became an abyss that never even ended. At one battle, the Battle of Somme, 600,000 died in a week. These are extraordinary numbers. And these were the kind of numbers that made Stalin's purges in the Holocaust possible. It had been unthinkable that such slaughter should take place. But after the First World War, it was no longer unthinkable for millions to die. What would have been inconceivable in 1913 was thoroughly conceivable now. It reshaped the European mind, the European soul, of what was inconceivable and what was doable. And what was doable was done. Because enlightenment also taught you that there's no limits to human reason, to which we always mean will cure every disease in the world. But there's another teaching. There is no limit. And Europe became limitless in the slaughter that it brought to bear. In 1910, a man no <clears throat> called Norman Angell, who won the Nobel Prize years later, wrote a book called The Great Illusion, where he demonstrated that a war between Germany, France, and Russia was impossible because the financial relationships were so integrated that it would mean financial catastrophe. And if maximizing financial benefits were the most important thing in human life, then he would have been right. And he was an economist, and so for an economist, of course, protecting your investment is the first thing that we all think about. Except it's not true. The war did happen. The catastrophe financially was overwhelming. And all of the assumptions of rational economic thought was thrown out because another rationality was there. The rationality of war and the rationality of geopolitics. It is always easy for us to say, well, we wouldn't have done the same thing. But I doubt that the Europeans who did this were all that different from any of us. It was us doing this. What came out of this was a propensity to slaughter by Lenin, by Trotsky, by Stalin, by Hitler, by Franco, by all of Europe that was beyond any limits, not of civilization, but of even common sense which is why common sense is such a poor guide to what's going to happen. Because common sense tells you that clearly we have modest desires, limited fears, and we manage them. For which it may have been true at a certain point, but not in these 31 years. 
At the end of this 31 years, which was one war, First and Second World War, we called it, but part of it was the Russian Civil War, the purges, everything was part of a single fabric. At the end of this, Europe, the Europe of Mozart, the Europe of Newton, was devastated in ways that you can see still around you. The wars were opportunities for great heroism. I was shown the building in which those who killed Heydrich drowned themselves, shot themselves in the basement. Their names should be remembered forever. But so should Heydrich's. These were both Europeans. What came out of the Second World War was a most important thing. The end of the European Empire. Up until that point, for the previous 200 years, there was not a part of the world that at some point had not been under the control, the influence, the domination of a European power. Even Belgium had the Congo, which I think is one of the funniest things. Europe had dominated the world. It had not only dominated itself, it had not only dominated reason, it had not only dominated nature, it had dominated the world. And it lost it. It engaged in a slaughter so extraordinary that it completely lost it. And the loss of that, I am not convinced, is better for the world. But that's another argument to be had. What was left was a Europe that was devastated. And there were two questions. How in the world can we recover? And we've all heard my the stories of my parents sitting in Budapest asking the metaphysical question, is it appropriate to eat pork? We were Jewish, we were religious. Of course you eat pork, you idiot. It's food. But these were the conversations, life and death and metaphysics that took place in Europe at this time. And there is introduced to Europe something that was born of Europe but was not European, the United States. The United States was different. How different we are only now beginning to learn, but it is truly a different place. And it addressed this question of, I'll put it in American terms in Texas, how the hell do you get these guys not to do this again? And this was a very reasonable question. They were not interested in Mozart. They were not interested in Newton. They were not interested in the symphony. They were interested in two things, the Russians and getting these guys back to work. And the Americans came in and began transforming Europe into something they thought was an image of themselves, but would never happen. But still, they changed the world, the, the European world at least. And they came and they realized one vital thing, that Europe cannot survive as a bunch of warring nations. That it was necessary that they integrate at least economically because the situation here was a complete mess and we can't have you guys competing, so get it together. And that was part of the Marshall Plan. And the Europeans rejected the idea vehemently. The French said they did not want to be integrated with the Germans. The British said they didn't want to be integrated with the French and nobody wanted to be integrated with the Italians. And this appalled the United States because the Americans understood that under the current circumstances we're pouring this money in and they don't want to work together. All right, this, this happens. Why did Europe begin to adopt integration? It was not Spock. It was not the great ideas. It was this, Charles de Gaulle realized that he was now a second-rate power, third-rate perhaps, to the United States. He understood that France could not flourish in the circumstance. 
And he thought if he allied with Germany and became the senior partner of Germany, in other words, occupied Germany, he's the goal, Europe could be resurrected under French leadership and counterbalance the United States. He therefore accepted the idea of European integration. And this is important because when you fantasize about the origins of the European Union and the high-minded things, it's very much like the slaveholders who founded the United States. The rhetoric was wonderful, the reality was a little painful. This was not a European idea. Yes, Europeans had the idea, but this was a geopolitical requirement of the United States. A united Western Europe was essential to face the Soviet Union. The Soviets were in the center of Germany, and the American theory was the wealthier Europe was, the more weapons they could build and the more Europeans would block the Germans, the Russians, relieving us of the requirement. And the less communism would be attractive. We were not doing this out of love and charity. We were doing this to contain the Soviet Union. The Europeans didn't do this because of the ode to joy. It wasn't Beethoven's Ninth Symphony that moved them. It was French ambition to be the dominant power of Europe. The German desire to somehow recover from this catastrophe. And the United States you know, the rest, once the French were in and the Germans were in and the United States wanted this to happen, we began the long, difficult process toward Maastricht. In due course, this idea was, of course, adopted by the Europeans. And like all sensible people, we believe that all good ideas were invented by us. It's very important to forget the past. But the idea of European integration in the face of the loss of their empire, in the face of the catastrophic depopulation of areas of the Soviet army, this was the root of Maastricht. And it faced a fundamental reality that I'll state in today's terms. The European continent, including Russia, is the second smallest continent in the world. Only Australia is smaller, and I don't consider it a continent, even though my wife is Australian, and I don't care. <laughs> it has 52 independent states at this point. The second smallest continent, North America, essentially has three. Europe has 52. If you want a simple, quick understanding of the problem of Europe, 52 states Different languages, different religions, different visions, and very long memories of the other one's crimes. So, 52 people, how do you live and not have a war on this continent? And the answer that finally emerged as the Europeans adopted this idea was first, of course, the British had their own outer seven. The French had, it was wonderful story, not a simple story, and certainly not one that really deserves the ode to joy as, as the background music, but it worked. And in 1991, something vital happened. Simultaneously, almost, the Maastricht Treaty was signed and the Soviet Union collapsed. And it appeared that history had ended. For once, Europe was unified. The Russians were gone, soon to be joining the EU as a liberal democracy, and that was the thinking. And history had transformed. And within the Maastricht Treaty, what was the principle? The principle of the United States was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The 
The Maastricht Treaty promised happiness. Peace and prosperity were the two principal guarantees. A wonderful principle, and I endorse it. But what happens if one, the other, or both disappear? The Europeans, of course, didn't end the war in Europe. During the 1990s, after the Maastricht Treaty was signed, 100,000 people died in the Balkans. The European answer was, oh, it's the Balkans, it's not us. Which, in a way, is true, and in a way, is nonsense. So, there was war. There was Nagorno Karabakh. There was conflict. But not within the EU. With this entity, not that. And then began a second vision. As Eastern Europe, as I still call us, uh, were liberated, the question became how to make them liberal democracies. The answer, in looking back, was they are liberal democracies. They have been liberal democracies, with the exception of Romania, who did the best they could. But Czechoslovakia didn't have to be taught to be a liberal democracy. Poland was going to be... You were liberal democracies. You had been occupied. You had been occupied by two monsters. They were gone. You're going to go back to the way you were. But the European Union had this vision that the former Soviet states had to be integrated into the European Union to, to guarantee. <coughs> All right, well, you didn't mind. It was, looked like a good idea. And then it went on a wave of expansion, reaching the reductio ad absurdum when Cyprus joined. So the expansion was built on a certain hubris, which was, once you are in the European Union, you will become European. And once you become European, you'll have peace and prosperity. There was a logical leap here that was taken, that wasn't reasonable, it wasn't true, but it was believed. It was believed that the mission of the European Union was not to be an, an efficient alliance, but to be a proto-United States. We in the United States built ourselves from the revolution through the Civil War which was the culminating moment. And in that civil war, we debated the question of are the states sovereign or are they part of one larger sovereign entity? And we discussed this and then went to war. And 600,000 people died in that war. The problem here was that the same question was being posed for the European Union. Is Hungary sovereign? Is Hungary subordinate? Is this an entity in which we are all joined? Is this a voluntary alliance? These are all the questions that went before the American Federation was created. And you had the same questions. There was, however, one difference. 600,000 people died in the American Civil War. How many Europeans would die for the EU? You laugh, and always they laugh, and always they should, because the fundamental truth of the European Union is that nobody in their right mind would die for it. You may die for the Czech Republic or Czechia. Not for Czechia. You don't die for that. <laughs> I have a problem with this. Uh, you may die for Poland. They seem to be eager. Uh, you may die for many things, but no one is going to die for Europe. Why? Why won't they die for the European Union? It is because it is not a nation state. Because a nation shares commonality, shares fate. So, there was a time when the South didn't want to have the monetary policies that the North had. We settled that. Now, Texas does not want to transfer money to New York during the banking crisis. I can assure you. It's not subject to discussion. We share a fate. California did not go to war with Japan, and Illinois decides that it was going to trade with Japan. This is a nation. When Czechoslovakia was invaded, 
by the Russians, by the Germans. It was all Czechoslovakia that was invaded, not three counties that decided not to participate. And this is what the European Union never became. It was nothing other than a treaty. It was not a nation. We spoke of Europe, and as Big Ned Brzezinski once asked the wonderful question, if I need to talk to Europe, who do I call? And this is the problem America has with Europe. Who do we call? And this is the problem that the Europeans have. If there's a problem, who do you call? You have some migrants coming here. It happens. Who do you call? And do they have to listen? If you are a treaty, then you are in it for your benefits. You are not there to sacrifice. You are not there to give your life. You are there because you do better inside the treaty rather than outside the treaty. And that's what you have here, a treaty. And if the British want to leave, they're going to leave. And if the Poles don't want to listen to anyone, they won't listen to them. And the French never listened to anyone from the very beginning. I mean, how many things did the French not listen to? Because the French understood something. They were French, not European. And that was a very important understanding to have. For much of the rest of the Europe, they spent the time up to 2008 in an illusion that this question would never come up. And then in seven weeks, in 2008, it came up. It came up first in August 8th when the Russians invaded Georgia. Because suddenly the basic presumption, which was that Europe had no strategic problems, the only thing we had to worry about was to optimize the euro, Russia returned to history. And it's, resonation, it's still resonating today in Ukraine and Moldova and everywhere. And then Russian aircraft buzzing American destroyers. For me, it makes my heart warm that we're back. I understand this world. I never understood the Islamic wars. But Russians buzzing American ships, yeah, that's good. Then came seven weeks later, the fall of Lehman Brothers. And with the fall of Lehman Brothers, the entire financial structure of the world shuddered, and I will argue, of Europe cracked and still hasn't been reconstructed. For the United States, this is the fourth time since World War II we had a financial crisis. There was in the 70s one, uh, municipal bonds, third world debt, savings and loan crisis. And how did we handle it? We had the head of the Federal Reserve, the Secretary of Treasury, eight bankers get into a room on a Sunday, scream at each other, break 50 laws on the way to settling it, and leave. Monday morning, the banks opened. There isn't a room big enough to contain the European decision makers. You can't do that in Europe, and you didn't do that in Europe. Instead, you began asking whose fault it was. Well, financial crises happen. You put them in jail later. Right now, you deal with it. And suddenly, you discovered that the people that the Germans lent money to were irresponsible and lied. And I know the Deutsche Bank examiners are very simple people, and the Greeks could fool them at any time. But maybe they had some idea of what was there. I mean, did any of us not know what Cyprus was? At the time they were let in, we didn't know. So Europe engaged in a game where the question was, should the creditors or debtors absorb the cost? And they took a vote and they decided the debtors. And the net result was that in Southern Europe, the unemployment rate is in excess of 20% which is the same unemployment rate the United States had in the Great Depression. So in Southern Europe, you have a catastrophe, a social catastrophe. We have a friend in Greece who was an architect with the government. He used to earn 3,000 euros. 
a month. He now barely gets 800. Because remember, when you talk about cutting back the government, in these countries, you're cutting back doctors, architects, the electrical system. It, it's not like in Texas you're getting rid of the motor vehicle bureau, which everybody hates. This is Europe, and cutting government spending creates a situation where a 45-year-old man knows that he's never going to have a job again doing what he did. And what comes out of this? What comes out of the fact that unemployment in southern Italy, youth unemployment, is at 50%, including college graduates? What comes out of this is two things. Anger and political movements. It's always interesting to me that the EU condemns Poland and Hungary. What did they expect would happen? The prime minister of Hungary would, was elected by the Hungarian people, and he was elected with overwhelming numbers, and he was elected to be something the European Union didn't approve of. But the European Union also believes in democracy. So it's a democracy, and you should vote for what I want. The confusion mounts, and it mounts, and it mounts. The rise of nationalism, of course, is the critical thing. Because in the end, every prime minister is going to do what his public wants, not what the European Commission wants. And in the end, each Moldovan, each Romanian, each Serbian will have more in his heart for an other Serbian than he has for someone he can't even speak to. This is simply the nature of human life. I like America. I like Texas. Whether I like Philippines is an elective affinity. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. But it is not natural. And the European Union tried to create something natural, a shared fate among radically different people. So where we are now is the resurrection of the nation state in Europe. Everywhere. Where it hasn't happened yet, it's slowly happening. With one final word. At the center of all of this, I began by talking about Germany. And we must talk about Germany because Germany is at the center of this as always. But I will point out one statistic. Germany exports 50% of its GDP just a little under. The fourth largest economy in the world depends on its stability, on its customers. And we are living in a situation where all the exporters of anything, China, Saudi Arabia, Russia, are reeling. And Germany is not yet reeling. Well, there's a story there. But how long can this go on? So everyone is looking at the U European Union as the Germans will solve the problem. Look at the German banks and try to understand why they're in that condition. And then when you understand why they're in that condition, you'll understand why Germany is the problem. And this has nothing to do with Hitler, the Kaiser, or anything else. It has to do with when the center of gravity of Europe shudders, everything destabilizes. In this case, everything has destabilized. One of the greatest things that I enjoyed was when the Europeans announced they were going to send Coast Guard ships to the Greek coast in June. It doesn't work. And everybody knows it doesn't work. And the European Union won't go away. It will simply be ignored. And that's what's happening. But at the root of this now, we come back to Germany. Germany that was the magnificent solution to the post-Cold War world, the post-war world, that was the anchor of the European Union, is dependent on its customers for one half of the GDP in a world in recession or stagnation at best. How long does that keep up? And what happens when that falls off in Germany, where we've already seen hints of what it looks like? 
Europe has always been a dangerous place. You learned that at your kitchen table. For a while there, it seemed like you'd abolished. You may still control it, but you will not control it as the EU. You will control it as the Czech Republic, as Slovakia, as Poland, and so on. Because you can't pull it together because of the fragility of Germany. All of the thinking about the crisis that started in 2008 had somehow that the Germans would pull it together. First, they don't want to. And second, they can't. They can't because it's too big. And they can't because they themselves, as they know well, are in trouble. So what happens in Europe? It remains a magnificent place where, if not symphonies, then rock music or something will take its place. It remains a place of extraordinary talented people, tremendous wealth, but it returns to being what it always was, the second smallest continent with the most nations imaginable. Where that goes, we all hope. But we also know that in Europe, hope is a very misleading thing. You can have it, you can feel it, but it does not your guide. So let me stop there, and then people can throw things at me and whatever you need. Thank you very, very much. I guess that you raised the bar for the public lecture in the town high. It would be difficult to match this next time. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, uh, we do have about 30, maybe 40 minutes for uh, your questions, remarks, uh, comments, so I will be collecting your raised hands and uh, there is a traveling microphone as always. And before you would uh, make your mind uh, and think about, about the questions, perhaps I would start with, uh, with uh, my question. Uh, you rightly pointed and that was the, the start and, 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 and the end of, of your presentation uh, about the central role of Germany. And you were talking a lot about the past, about uh, the present times. Uh, so we should also spend some time uh, discussing uh, with the future, uh, especially with you as a forecaster. And I remember 25 years ago, or a bit more when the Germany became unified and uh, there was a grand debate, you know, because not everybody was very happy with that. Uh, this debate, you know, what uh, we would have, uh, what we would get as a reward for the consent with the unified Germany, whether uh, in Europe would be uh, a European Germany or German Europe. And uh, the majority of the people uh, including the Germans like Chancellor Kohl and others, they argued strongly that time for European Germany instead of uh, German Europe. Uh, after 2008, when the real problem has emerged with the crisis of the Eurozone, with uh, uh, the migration uh, crisis now, and with some uh, decision by Germany, which uh, some of them were made without any consultation, like uh, the energy when the, uh, especially uh, goodbye to, uh, to nuclear power plants, or now with the, the immigration, which is chances set uh, last August, uh, they were simply made by Germany with the effect on the others, uh, or they were the, 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 the strong German policy uh, requiring the fulfillment of the rules of the game, like in the Greek uh, crisis. Uh, so, again, all those um, uh, 
uh, expressions of the German policy has established the question that what we got, it's rather uh, uh, German Europe than European uh, Germany. So how do you see uh, this in future, what we will have, a European Germany or German Europe? Okay. The Germans will act in the interests of their nation. If they don't, they will be voted out of office by the public, who has a deeper interest in their own in future than in yours. So that is built into democracy. We all like democracy, and now we're going to see it. The German position initially was that, of course, I want the European Union. I'm a massive exporter, and the free trade zone is a gift. Thank you. But more than that, they are serious people, and they could see that Europe, in some form of unification, can protect its interests collectively, economically, politically, even potentially militarily, far better than individually. And the Germans were certainly and are certainly not interested in a replay of the 31 years. That's not what they're doing. But as they lose control over others, and particularly in what I regard as a fairly minor crisis, the migrant crisis, um, they have lost control. Now, they have to make a decision. We will s submit to the demands of the other European countries where they have a problem because the other de demands are so contradictory that you can't possibly boil them down to a policy. Every country has a different interest. And therefore, by default, the Germans will listen to the, try to follow the interests of their people. The Germans are no more monstrous in doing this than the Greeks or the Italians or anyone else. Um, that is the whole point of the nation state that the Enlightenment celebrated, that every people has a right to its nation. The Enla European Union tried to square the circle. Everybody has a right to a nation in the context of the European Union. And for that, we will give you peace and prosperity. Well, if they had, didn't, it would have worked. Unfortunately, there was inevitably going to be a financial crisis. And inevitably, the effects on Europe would be different in different places. And inevitably, there was no one policy that could solve everyone's problems. And inevitably, the strongest nation defined the policies. I'm an American. I understand how this works. So the way you do it is you define whatever is your interest and announce that it's in everybody else's interest. We do that all the time. So do the Germans. So the answer is, you will see a Germany acting in its own interest. And this will frighten Poland. It'll drive the French up a wall, not because the Germans intend to, but because the Germans have the ability to destabilize things. So this is the old story. And what I'm arguing is, history never ended. It was suspended, awaiting the first financial crisis. And now we are back where we were with the German question. What will the Germans do? And hopefully that will be kept in the confines of interest rates or something. OK, thank you. I saw Daniel Kummermann uh, there uh, on, on the, the, there is a, and I, I may remind you, můžete se ptát taky česky, so you can also ask a question in the Czech language. We do have a interpreting here. Máme tu překlad, čili nemusíte, ti, kdo by se chtěli zeptat, ale netroufají si v angličtině, tak to mohou v pohodě učinit česky. Right. Uh, it seems that the major problem of Europe today is the migration crisis. <laughs> Introduce yourself first. Uh, my name is Daniel Kummerman. I come from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the, the current major problem for Europe is the migration and some whether tied to it or not, the terrorism and the radical Islam. So the question is, at the moment, it, it is a divisive problem for Europe, probably. 
can it become cohesive in longer run? I don't think that you have a migration problem. I have, think you have a structural problem in decision making. The United States came to Europe, there was 20 to 30 million people without homes. The United States decided it was an interest to do something about it. It did something about it. Europe has as well within its capacity to manage a few million people once you decide how you want to manage them. The problem here that got out of hand was that everybody was demanding that someone else do something. First, the Greeks should do something. You had to be joking. Then Macedonia. That was even funnier. And the consistent desire to to hold someone else responsible for failing to do what they're supposed to do. When the European Union finally created its own policy, and Merkel insisted that it be open borders, open settlement everywhere, then everything got out of hand. So looking at the American side, we have lots of immigrants every year. There are ways to do this, even if Donald Trump is crazy. There are ways to do this. You do not have a crisis of migration. This is less than about two-tenths of one percent of Europe's population that you're dealing with here, maybe more, half, half a percent. You have a problem in managing any decision. The European Union is no longer able to create collective solutions because of the differentiation of interests and because the European Union will not recognize as significant decision makers, minor countries. They exclude them from their consideration and it doesn't work. You have a terrorism problem. So I will give you the advice that Europeans gave the United States after 9-11. Don't overreact. It's easy to say. Very hard to do. The problem you have with terrorism is not existential. It is not going to destroy you, but it could destroy your civil liberties, it could destroy the confidence of the people in their government. It could have very severe confidence, which is why they you do this. You have to make decisions, and you have to make them in certain ways. In the United States, which has been deeply criticized by the Europeans for this, became very aggressive in listening to telephone conversations. Why? Because how do you know who's a terrorist? Hopefully you can pick up a hint on the telephone. He's stupid. My point is that Europe has to decide on a continental-wide basis what the strategy is. In the United States, in every war we had except Vietnam and Iraq, there was violations of civil liberties. In World War II, there was extreme censorship of what newspapers could print, and other things as well. Japanese being taken to camps. This is what happens. You have a price to pay. So on the one hand, I get the sense that the Europeans are panicked. On the other hand, they can't decide what they'll give up. And there's nothing, nobody strong enough to do it. So I would argue that, again, the problem in Europe is not the problem. The problem in Europe is the ability to make rapid, good decisions and have the confidence of the people in the decisions that are being made. And if you can't solve that, you can't fight terrorism. Uh, thank you very much. Great answer, definitely. I think it deserves a round of applause. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for a brilliant uh, lecture. And uh, as I agree with you, the sheer problem with migration might be a slight artificial. I would like to shift the focus to something a bit different. I would like to ask you uh, what is your opinion on the current reinvigoration of uh, conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh? I don't know if I pronounced that properly. I hope so. Uh, and do you think it uh, might be a sign of, uh, of general uh, shift of focus of, of Russia, which was a topic maybe slightly neglected in your otherwise brilliant lecture? Thank you very much. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict broke out and 18 people on one side died and 12 on the other. This was declared by the entire world to be a breakout of a major war. That was silly. Now why did that happen? I, 
I know something about this region. The guys get drunk, they open fire, mortars come down. It could have been that. I don't know what it was. It could have been a deliberate provocation by the Azeri government because they're in deep financial trouble and they want to divert attention and the Gernot Karabakh really is an issue for them publicly. It could have also been the Russians encouraging the Armenians to do something so they could step in as they did and offer to mediate. The Russians are now very badly trying everywhere to be relevant. They're trying to be relevant because the Putin government had a disaster occur in Ukraine. They lost the Ukraine and they lost it clumsily and because they have a huge financial crisis because of the decline of oil. And that reflects the underlying reality of Russia, which is that it's a third world country living in exports and entirely dependent on its price of exports for its sustenance. It intervened in Syria. The Americans were shocked, but very happy. The United States did not want Assad overthrown, but not right now, because right now we have ISIS, and the last thing we want is ISIS in Damascus. Go further a little bit, and the Russians come in. The Americans can't politically defend Assad, and the Russians come in. Well, obviously, the Russians and the Americans have talked before because you don't bring in 70 fighter planes into airspace controlled by the Americans without letting them know you're coming. So, Assad is saved for the moment. ISIS is isolated. The Russians are heroes. And now they're flying over our destroyers in the Baltic. I should tell you that this was advertised as practicing a, a, a practice run for an attack. This is not how you attack a destroyer. You never see it. You launch a missile from 70 to 80 miles out. The ship's anti-missiles fire. They also fire at the plane, which tries to get out of range. If you fly over an American destroyer, and you make a hostile act, you wind up in little pieces. So it was not the Russians doing that, but it was the Russians letting us know that they want a photo opportunity. And we gave them one. There are some important discussions, I think, going on between the United States and Russia, I guess. And I would say these follow from Syria and the Russian withdrawal, because now the Russians want to talk about Ukraine. And now the question is, what is the deal on Ukraine? It's a hard one. But the possibility, since you've asked about that, is what do the Russians want? They want to guarantee that Kiev is not a member of NATO and NATO forces are not deployed along the Russian border. The U.S. has absolutely no desire to deploy forces along the Russian border because when you say NATO forces, you mean our forces. And we don't want to go there. The Russians are afraid of neutralization will be violated by the Americans and they'll rush forward. The Americans are afraid that the Russians will violate neutralization and they will rush forward threatening our position in Romania, particularly. Both sides are tr I really want to avoid a conflict. Neither side trusts the other. Why should they? So there has to be some way to build confidence. I suggest that Chechen troops serve as peacekeepers, the Chechen. I, I, I can't do that. <laughs> Czech troops. So, I mean, this is my read in the karabakh It is part of a system of activities the Russians are conducting in order to gain credibility and leverage over the United States in this conf confrontation. Good. Okay, so Pavel Fischer and then somebody at uh, uh, the room, někdo ušetný tam zvedal ruku ještě. My name is Pavel Fischer. Uh, I'm director of STEM. I have a question related to Transatlantic Relations Center, which is hosted this wonderful evening. Could you just develop how to reinforce, re-engage transatlantic relation tie based on values and based on uh, the share uh, responsibility concerning individual rights, 
if there is a lack of strategic posture on the side of Europe, how you would re-engage within NATO or uh, what is the framework you would see as relevant? Thank you. It's, this is a very important question because right now U.S.-NATO partner relations are severely drained. Donald Trump, you know, made the statement that we should pull out of NATO. And everybody in Washington said, oh, my God, no. The rest of the country, they said, yeah, what do they do for us lately? So here, here's the problem the United States has with NATO at the core of the transatlantic relationship. Europe has 200 million more people almost than the United States and a larger GDP. There is no reason in the world why Europe, Europe collectively should not have a military force equal in size and quality with the United States. In 1955, there was a good reason. 65, 75, okay, fine. This is 2015. There is no basis for the asymmetry of NATO. NATO is also a problem for us because on the one hand we have to operate through NATO, get approval by all countries including Greece and who else? So, I mean, our experience of our European partners is they will first tell us we need to do something. We will do us, and then they will do it, and they will then criticize us for doing it. I mean, Libya is a perfect example. The French and the Italians asked us in. We agreed, and then it blew up, and we were criticized. So from an American point of view, the question is, what precisely do we get out of NATO, except from a lot of meetings and slip, as we used to say? What do we get? One of the first things the Europeans can do is say, look, a military alliance has a foundation. You have a military. And Europe, if it wants NATO, must begin a process. We're not expecting overnight, okay? of building a military force that has m m effective capabilities, not symbolic. Okay? We don't need a company of troops accompanying us should we go to war. We need war fighting systems that will allow us to keep our kids out of the war. So there's a fundamental disconnect between Europe and the United States on this. And I'll put it this way. I've mentioned this many times now. I have two kids, both military. It is not at all rare for someone in my class, if you will, to have children making either careers or doing a service in there. Um, in Europe, it is fairly rare to join the, the military as a choice by people who have other choices. But it also means that every time we talk about interventions, we're talking about very personal things in the United States. The United States has now reached the conclusion, because we're not complete idiots, just mostly idiots, that we're probably not going to turn Iraq into a liberal democracy. There's good evidence. And we are not going to send our kids into Syria. And when I say our kids, it literally is our kids. And there's a fundamental cultural distinction between Europe and the United States and the way it looks at these matters. And Washington, too, because they're in a different world, I think. Out in the country, military service, there are today 40 million veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces living in the United States. Add their wives, husbands, others. It is a huge constituency. War is not alien to us. The military is not alien to us. It is alien to you, we feel. The transatlantic alliance cannot be bridged until this discrepancy is bridged. In the meantime, the American structure is very simple. We do not want to see the Russians impinging on Central Europe. We will deploy forces to Poland to prevent that. We will deploy forces to Romania. If you want us to discuss it with NATO, we will discuss it. 
If you don't like it, you can lump it. We're there. This is what is evolving again. The basic framework is the nation state is revolving. The multilateral institutions are failing. The United States will deal with individual nation states to pursue its interests. I believe that we are deeply open to a redefinition of NATO in which the burden is equally shared and decision making is streamlined. But the transatlantic relationship survived the Soviet Union by 20, 30 years. I don't know how much longer it can survive in that form. You cannot have a military alliance in which Germany, the leading country, has to hire Ukrainian airplanes to fly 100 troops to Afghanistan. You just can't do that. So you have asked the question in the way the Europeans, I'm sorry, don't mean to criticize, ask what, what could we do to strengthen the European-American relationship? To which I answer, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> if you want to be in NATO, meet at least your minimal NATO obligations, which is 2% of GDP. That's uh, the answer. Uh, we don't expect it to happen, but that's the answer. Okay, so, Chris. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Martin Schenkora. Uh, Mr. Friedman, uh, I would like to ask, uh, you described uh, various like dynamics within the Europe between the French and the Germans, for example, between the uh, creditors and debtors. I would uh, like to ask uh, what is the current dynamic between uh, Great Britain and the uh, rest of the continental Europe? Because in, a, in the last year it became, I think, rather obvious that Britain is not and cannot be a part of continental Europe politically. Uh, but they also, I think, don't want the you know, chaos on the European continent. They also don't want to continental Europe be united against them. So basically, what should they do? Well, let's examine the question of what happens to Britain if they leave. You've got to stop selling them goods? You'll stop buying the stuff from Britain? I mean, what is going to happen? You're a trade. In the end, this is a trade union. Trade will go on. But the most important thing is I thought that when this question came up, the question of British exiting the European Union was a significant question. I don't think it's that significant now. Because at this point, the Union, European Union has established that any rule you don't want to follow, you don't. So Britain can have exactly what it wants, stay in the European Union and ignore any rule that it doesn't want to follow. What are you going to do? I don't know if they're going to vote to stay in or out, but the real problem is not what happens if Europe leaves. It's who else is going to leave. And the real question here, and this is what frightens Germany more than anything else, what happens to the free trade zone? At the heart of everything else, there is a European free trade zone. It is a free trade zone to which half of Germany's exports go. And you can make the case, as much as you like free trade, that many of the countries are not developing in the South, for example, because you can't develop. <coughs> the rules of the EU make entrepreneurial behavior very difficult. Because in Europe, you don't hire someone, you adopt him. You know, he's in your family. So entrepreneurial risk is way high, and I call this a semen defense fund. You are not going to have a Google or a Microsoft or an Apple come out of nowhere challenging Siemens here. Okay, that's fine. That's how you do it. But the question that has not been put on the table yet but will be put on the table is, as Britain leaves, what is the value of this free trade zone? Are we better off with it or without it? And that is the question that raises the heart of the issue of the EU. And that is the question that no one who supports the EU wants to have raised. And with Britain leaving and the catastrophe not happening, and it won't, other people will consider, you know, maybe we don't have to let in German imports 
without any tariffs. Always remember that Germany developed with protections on its industry and with free access to the United States. Now, we were nice, we were just trying to build up Germany. I don't think that Germany would be the country it is today had it not been able to protect its industries in the 1950s. Now, this is not my argument, this is for you guys to, to settle. But I think at the heart of Brexit is not the question of the future of Britain, because Britain has an intimate relation with the United States that it could have a free trade agreement tomorrow. The real issue here is what is the future of the European free trade agreements? Can they be sustained? And <clears throat> I, I won't, that's too pessimistic to go. Okay, so. Dobrý večer. My name is Petr Hornický, and I will keep uh, asking my question in English. Uh, you are mentioning in your book uh, Turkey as a military power, able and uh, ready to action. Could you please uh, expand more on that topic and on uh, um, possible cooperation or alliance of uh, interest between Turkey and Germany. Thank you very much. What I had said was that Turkey would be a great power. As I said in Turkey, it was very, not very well greeted. You will be a great power, you're not one yet. Nevertheless, it is the indispensable power all around. The European issues pivot around Turkey. Russia and Turkey are now engaged in negative ways. The Middle East question, the United States is pressing the Turks to get in, and the Turks are pressing not to. We're in a period where history has developed, you pardon me as I expected, putting Turkey on the pivot, but Turkey is not yet developed to the point that it can intervene, and it doesn't want to. It understands the risks of Syria. It's engaged Russia, and that is pleasing to the United States, not to shoot down of the plane, but the general position. And it's become indispensable as a solution for the Europeans. I, I enjoyed watching you pay for them to take their, their uh, migrants, your migrants. So it's a critical country. It is not yet a decisive country. And it's partly not decisive because it doesn't want to be. The relationships with Germany is, well, I mean, obviously, you have this problem. The Germans invited the Turks in as Gastarbeiten. They didn't develop the theory of multiculturalism, which sounded very liberal. But what it basically said was, you can come to Germany, but stay a Turk. And in staying a Turk, you're not integrated into German society, which is fine if the Turks want it. Following the Turks they wanted, now they got a bunch of others that they didn't want. But never forget that the European Islamic crisis, if you will, begins with Europe inviting them in and then marginalizing them through a conscious process of what citizenship means, the guest worker programs, things of that sort. I think the Turks feel in some sense responsible, but the Turks are very cynical about this. Better your problem than theirs. So I think the German-Turkish relations will pivot around other issues, such as economic relationships and other relationships. Um, but I think Turkey is, has two, two things to say about Turkey. One, the best thing that ever happened to it was it wasn't led into the EU. I mean, that was a lucky break. Number two, this is a country that is a very serious country and is emerging as a major regional player to the extent that it's impressive in the way it doesn't engage. It deals with its problems its way and not even the United States jumping up and down and waving its arms can get them to change that. And that's where you start seeing great power status emerge. Charles. 
Charles Ross, European Anti-Corruption Center. I'd like to thank Severo and Ambassador Bondra for hosting us today, and thank you, sir, for your time. In light of today's comments a few hours ago by Secretary General Stoltenberg in Brussels in the NATO-Russian meeting, and in parallel the reverse spin in, nation, in Russian media, obviously claiming that they have a victory in being allowed back into the camp, we see massive movements of heavy armaments towards the contact line in Ukraine. Over the past six months, we have seen hundreds and hundreds of trains bringing in tremendous amounts of heavy equipment and armaments from Mariupol to the north. In recent days, you mentioned that you were anticipating a Russian major offensive in Ukraine in 2017. Just as the Russian press said I was saying. Yes, exactly. Yes, <laughs> I didn't say that. Fascinating. Yes, it's interesting about who talks about who. Exactly. And this is the, this is the issue, the reverse, the reverse politics. Well, the, I mean, the, 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 the Russians are wonderful in selecting the quotes. Here's yes, what exactly. It's just total nonsense. But given the situation and given the destabilization in Russia and the creeping economic crisis, how do you see the situation developing in the Donbass? Thank you, and have fun with it. Well, begin with this thing, a certain statement. Ukraine is indispensable to the Russians. Russia, since the 18th century, has survived with buffer states. The Baltics, Belarus, and particularly Ukraine. It was because of those buffer states, for example, that they were not defeated by the Nazis. The space of Ukraine in particular was critical in grinding the Wehrmacht down. And the Russians remember this, and they also understand that if Belarus and Russia became pro-Western, then Smolensk would be a border town. So there is a real strategic imperative for the Russians to at least have the neutralization of Ukraine. And going beyond that pushes them to a point where they really have to act. Now, there are two variables. One, never underestimate the ability of the Ukrainian government to collapse or be chaotic, especially with the help of the FSB, now that all the Ukrainian people, experts are gone, they bought a new bunch, and they may actually be able to do something. They are very happy to have a negotiated settlement so long as that settlement includes the neutralization of Ukraine, and they can trust it. I mean, that's, and that's the topic discussed. But if you want a good negotiation, deploy your forces. So, you know, if you're going to engage in a negotiation with the United States, you have to hit it in the head with a two-by-four before you do that. The Russians were not able last year to launch an offensive because their armored capabilities, the ability, the logistical capabilities of keeping those tanks refueled, even without opposition, the T-72 breaks down. They have spent the last year rebuilding systems, more systems and weapons. They have, in my estimation, which is worth very little, an other year to go before they're combat capable. Until that point, they'll play a game of bluff and hope they get a settlement and make it very certain that every Reuters correspondent sees every tank go by five times. They're good at this. But there's, there's another problem here that the Russians have that you must bear in mind. The Soviet Union fell because of two circumstances. One, massively increased defense spending and the collapse of the price of oil. Those two things, when they combined, destabilized them. I don't think they have massively increased defense spending, but they certainly have increased it. And they certainly had a much worse collapse of prices than before, which means that they are very, very worried. Beneath all this posturing and even bothering taking my quotes and using them, I mean, you've got to be desperate to take my quotes and use them. I mean, who am I? Um, Behind all of this 
is a very, very worried Russian elite because they're looking at the financial situation and they are being feel pressed to do something about Ukraine to maintain national popularity, and that's the danger. So you would think that they would become more co less cautious, more cautious, I should say, by the circumstance. They become less cautious. They have to be. They have to take risks that they wouldn't take otherwise, and that's where it gets hairy. So, I think the last question, Roman. Hmm? Roman the Institute. Mr. Friedman, I have read your book and have two questions. One is a particular, the other one a general one. The particular one is on the uh, future of German-Russian relations. I agree with your prediction that if Germany and Russia make a deal, then the future of Poland and Baltic states will be fixed. However, it seems to me that your main argument for such a possible deal is a German tendency to find new markets because Southern Europe is not profitable anymore. Do you really think that 140, 150 million of Russians are enough attractive market for Germany to, to prefer a deal with Russia and have hostilities with neighboring countries in Central Europe? No, and, and that's, that's exactly the problem, which is that if Germany, uh, Southern Europe is already in chaos. The growth rate in Europe is weak. The growth rate in America is weak. The Middle East, which is a big customer of Germany, is in chaos. There is no solution to that problem. There's only mitigation. But the mitigation becomes very important to the Germans. In general, the Germans would like to sell to the Russians without any political connections. I mean, why not? They can sell. But the Russians may enter a situation where they want political connections in return for access. And here's the problem that the, the, of, you've put your finger on you know, the, the issue, which is that there is no silver bullet for Germany's problem. There are at best a mosaic of solutions and none of them are really satisfactory. But among the little tiny pieces is Russia. And how that evolves is unknown because we don't know what prices Russia has. And I, I don't even know if they'll be capable of buying in a year. So it's, there are many moving parts. But remember, Germany, with rising unemployment, also becomes unpredictable in its behavior. It is used to a stable platform of employment. And if unemployment surges because of, and Siemens let go of workers recently, uh, if that surges, Merkel's successor, and I think that's what we're talking about, uh, is going to have very different policies. I don't know what area. Okay. okay. Dr. Friedman has to leave five o'clock in the morning tomorrow, so uh, we should uh, uh, come to the end of this. And uh, many of you certainly decided to stay because of the book signing, so uh, let me just uh, conclude uh, with first and foremost the great thanks to you, because I think we early had an extraordinary event and you raised the bar for the lecturing very high and it would not be easy to, uh, to match it uh, next time. So once again, uh, thank you very much. It was very uh, I want also to thank to Tomasz Krsek for uh, doing this us together and for uh, becoming a publisher. We need, you know, more entrepreneurs to turn into the publishers and to do those uh, things. Uh, thirdly, let's uh, thanks to all of you because you have contributed to the greatness of the evening with your uh, important questions, remarks, and just uh, being with us here. As always, I use this opportunity to make the announcement about the next uh, evening here. Uh, so, the 
we have two uh, events this week, so for the rest of April we will have nothing, then are the May, uh, early May holidays. So the next time is uh, May the 10th, so it should be Tuesday if I'm correct, or uh, May the 10th, May the 10th, the Saturday of Vietnam, uh, 17 hours. Uh, přijede, I will tell this in Czech, uh, Pavel, uh, Pavel Lisický je velmi uh, známý a aktivní polský novinář a vydavatel, který stojí za mnoha uh, docela důležitými uh, časopisy do řeči a podobně. Uh, tak to bude uh, za A vystoupí uh, s tématem Kovadis Polonia o současném Polsku a v současné Evropě, čili to bude téma, takže trochu se soustředíme na to, co se děje v Polsku, protože jsou o tom různé diskuze. Pavel Lisický je spíš toho konzervativního tá.